In this video, we're calculating the electric potential at a distance of S from the tip of a uniformly charged rod with a total charge of Q and a length of L. And notice in the picture, we set the origin at the left end of that rod. And then we have a distance of S between the right tip of that rod and the observation point. That's where we're trying to measure the potential. Now, one really cool thing about this problem is once we get the electric potential as a function of S, we can use the gradient to compute the electric field at that observation point and then compare that electric field to our previous result that we got by directly integrating with Coulomb's law. Now, to get started with the potential calculation here, we want to break this rod into infinitesimal little point charges. And the whole point of this is that we understand what the potential of a point charge is already. So recall that the point charge potential is given by Q over 4 pi epsilon 0 R, where Q is the size of the charge and R is the distance from the charge. Well, this means for an infinitesimal little charge dQ, that contributes an infinitesimal amount to the electric potential, and we call that dV. So dV is equal to dQ over 4 pi epsilon 0 times R, where again, R is the distance between that charge and the observation point. Now we have to work out a few things with our distances here because we need to express that r in terms of an integration variable that I'm going to call x. So we're going to use x for the location of our little charge dq, and I'm just measuring that with respect to the origin over there at the left end of the rod. And this means the distance between the little charge and the right end of the rod must be l minus x. And then we can see that the r, the distance between dq and the observation point, is just l minus x plus s. So one more thing has to be worked out before we can set up our integral. We just need a quick reminder of the concept of linear charge density. So this is really handy for a lot of these one-dimensional electrostatics integrals. The linear charge density is charge per unit length. So that would be measured in coulombs per meter. And we normally give the symbol lambda to that. So lambda is Q divided by L. That can always be turned around to say that charge is linear density times length. But this is also true in infinitesimal form. A little charge dq is given by linear charge density times the little infinitesimal length of that guy, which is a small increment of x, so we call it dx. So there it is. We can always replace the dq with a lambda dx. So now we're ready to start setting up our integral here. What I want to do is express this dv entirely in terms of the integration variable x. So dv is dq over 4 pi epsilon 0 r, but dq can be written as lambda dx, and then the r is the distance between dq and the observation point. Again, we can write that as s plus l minus x. And now that our dv is phrased entirely in terms of a single variable x, we're ready to integrate this thing. So starting from the very beginning, we can say the total potential at the observation point is the sum of all the contributions to that potential. And this is what an integral does. It's a summation device for adding up infinitely many infinitesimal contributions. So we just put our dv inside that integral and try to calculate the thing. While I sub that in, I'm going to move all the constants out in front. So a lambda over 4 pi epsilon 0 comes out in front. And we're left with the integral of dx over s plus l minus x. And finally, we put in our limits of integration to cover this whole rod, to chop up this whole rod into little dqs all the way from the left end to the right end. We're looking at a range of x values from 0 to l. Now notice the form of the integral here is that we basically have the derivative of the denominator sitting in the numerator. If I look at the derivative of this denominator, it's going to be negative 1 because s and l are constants with respect to the integration. So if I can get a negative 1 in the numerator, and I'm just going to put a minus sign up there, and then compensate out in front with another minus sign, that gives me the derivative of the denominator sitting in the numerator, and that's always going to integrate to a natural log of the denominator. So basically what I'm doing here is just using the chain rule backwards so I don't have to do an explicit substitution. So our constants out in front now are negative lambda over 4 pi epsilon 0, and then my antiderivative is a natural log of that denominator and we need to evaluate this thing from 0 to L. So notice I didn't put absolute value bars around the argument of the natural log function. This is typical for a real application in physics. If I look in that argument, I know that L is bigger than X. So L minus X is always going to be non-negative, and I'm adding an S to that. So I have positive numbers in the argument of the natural log function. I don't have to worry about the absolute value bars. Now subbing in the upper and lower limits 
When I sum in the upper limit, I get an s plus l minus l in there. So I get just the natural log of s. And then when I sum in the lower limit, that's when x is equal to 0, I get a natural log s plus l. And we can clean that up a little bit using log properties. So one thing I'm going to do here is distribute the minus sign from out in front into those parentheses. That reverses the direction of the difference. And I end up with natural log s plus l minus natural log s. But that can be written as a fraction. So this cleans up to lambda over 4 pi epsilon 0, natural log s plus l divided by s. Now there's one more thing we typically do here. The original problem was given to us in terms of q and l instead of lambda. So we're just going to replace lambda with the total charge divided by the total length. And I end up with the potential off the tip of this uniformly charged rod. That's q over 4 pi epsilon 0 l multiplied by the natural log of s plus l over s. So now that we have the electric potential as a function of s, where s is the distance from the tip of the rod, we can use that to find the electric field at a distance of s from the tip of the rod. So notice here that I'm emphasizing the fact that that potential is a function of s. And what we're looking for here is the electric field at that point, which of course points to the right because the rod is positively charged. So recall that the electric field can be obtained from the potential function by using the gradient. So we have E is equal to negative del V. And I'll post a link to the video where that was first derived. Now we are in a one dimensional setting here. We're only looking at variation with respect to S. So the electric field component in the S direction is given by just the negative of the S derivative of V of S. And if we want to write the electric field as a vector, we just tack on an s hat, in other words, the unit vector in the direction of s, which in our case is just i hat, in other words, a rightward pointing unit vector. So I've got to get the negative of the s derivative of this potential function, and that should give us the s component of the electric field. So we have a bunch of constants out in front of this potential function, so that's a q over 4 pi epsilon 0 l. And then I need to differentiate the natural log of s plus l over s. Well, this is going to be way easier if we expand that back into a difference of two logs, because in its current form, I'd have to use the chain rule. So I'm going to write this as natural log s plus l minus a natural log of s. We'll just keep the minus sign in the numerator for the moment. And when I take the s derivative of natural log s plus l, I just get 1 over s plus l. I do the same thing for natural log s, and I get 1 over s. Now I want to find a common denominator on these so I can simplify the expression. So I multiply the first fraction by s over s and the second one by s plus l over s plus l. And now that I have a common denominator, I can just subtract those numerators. So my s's are going to cancel here. I have an s minus s. And I end up with a surviving factor of negative l up there in the numerator. But when I multiply that by the negative q out in front, I get a positive result. So I have a ql over 4 pi epsilon 0 l. And then my denominator was s times s plus l. Now the l's are going to cancel out of this. And I arrive at a final answer for the electric field component of q over 4 pi epsilon 0 s times s plus l. Now to be extra thorough with this answer, we really should express the electric field as a vector. So by taking the negative of that s derivative, we found the s component of the electric field, which happens to be the x component of the electric field. So to write it as a vector, we'll take that electric field s component and multiply it by i hat. And this agrees with the result we got for electric field when we directly integrated over this charge distribution and used Coulomb's law. If you enjoyed this video or at least found it useful, check out another one by clicking one of the links on the left. Or click the Zach's Lab logo on the right to explore dozens of physics and math playlists. As always, you can leave your questions, comments, and requests in the comments section below, and I'll get back to you within 24 hours. Thanks for watching Zach's Lab, and best of luck on your math and physics journey.